welcome to Higher Structure Seminar of Feza Gürsey Center for Physics and Mathematics. And this week our speaker is from uh, Australia. Uh, his name is David Roberts and he will talk on low dimensional higher geometry, a case study, which is a joint work with Raymond was uh, was so. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, um, <clears throat> this is a, a good opportunity to uh, air, air this work. Um, we released a preprint. Um, let's see, late last year uh, in September. So it's a bit of a, a beefy, a beefy preprint, as you might see. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so if that, um, I'll just note the the number for that in case you ever want to check any of the definitions and, and so forth, 2209055521. Okay, so um, there's some some uh, big, big definitions uh, which we can, uh, I will at some point, maybe point people to that. So this talk is mostly about um, a motivation and about the sort of conceptual ideas that um, lead us to this work. Um, <clears throat> so like higher geometry is a sort of a nebulous term. Um, when I was doing my PhD, there wasn't really a word for what we were doing. Um, and it was all very new, um, sort of just about the time I started my PhD, um, our higher gauge theory, uh, motivated by things from string theory and so on. And it was all very, um, you know, not very sure sort of where it was going or, or what it was good for. Um, there was some sort of vague motivations from string, string theory, but, um, you know, I, I became more of a mathematician as as I tried to figure out sort of what, what was going on. Um, and so, yeah, so high geometry, sometimes you'll see it and it's very much uh, people talk about um, higher categories and instantly it's infinity categories and so on. Um, but low dimensional here means we're basically going one step above ordinary sort of geometry that you might get in mathematical physics. Um, we're only sort of adding in one more categorical dimension as it were, um, as the minimum sort of necessary to see interesting phenomena. So, um, <clears throat> so this is, this is sort of maybe a cartoon sketch of what, um, <clears throat> the sort of thing that might happen if a mathematical physicist who sort of hears about higher gauge theory, maybe they're doing condensed matter physics, or maybe they're doing some kind of like um, sort of thinking about M theory or something. And they want to do some gauge theory and they heard some vague ideas that they need to look at some kind of differential form data, not valued in a Lie algebra, but like L infinity algebras or some other um, interesting homotopical structure. Um, and they go to their, their friendly higher topos theorist uh, who, who knows lots about uh, higher geometry and has very good uh, elegant theory and one 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 answer might be just go look at look at some you know lifts of some um, functors between infinity stacks. Uh, the mathematical physicist can't really do much with this because this mathematical physicist uh, who like me um, grew up reading things like, um, BPST monopoles and very classical geometry, uh, or maybe even um, thinking about deformations of of um, <clears throat> you know special special solutions of of Yang Mills equations. How do you how do you like plot you know do some kind of nice um, sort of numerical simulations or or uh, or things like that, um, and then. You know, in some cases, even some very like talking about the phi sphere, this was raised uh, to me as a question by um, Christian Seaman. Uh, we're talking about nine, eight, nine years ago. Um, you know, in the context of a particular model in uh, string theory, um, and in which case, in one sense, like from a point of view of high category theory, there's a unique solution up to some kind of isomorphism, uh, except that. Uh, when someone says, you know, actually write down, oh, sorry, 
uh, I got a question about the archive number. Um, I'll say that in just a moment. <clears throat> um, you know, there's one up to isomorphism, having one solution is nice, except you have to actually write down a solution. It's, it's you know, not enough to say that, you know, every every solution is good as it as is as good as any other solution. Um, it, you need to actually uh, um, need to actually uh, exhibit one. So this is kind of hard. <clears throat> so the physicists might want to actually plot something or even calculate numbers, right? Um, if the numbers are integers, then you know go well. It might be like an instanton number. Um, and these can be exhibited as like the connected components of some groupoid or higher groupoid, or maybe it's some kind of torsion number, right? You want to say, oh, it's a, it's some like Z mod two or Z mod three invariant. Um, maybe it's a root of unity. Okay. This is, this is much more, uh, it kind of is okay. But, um, <clears throat> imagine you want to calculate a special value of a solution of a DE. Like right, this, you know, maybe you want to show that it's like some particularly nice number. Um, coming from a point of view of purely higher category theory, like the category theory doesn't tell you about special functions. Um, this is very much more a bespoke operation. So we're not getting this as far as, you know, special values of special functions, but that's like the stretch goal. Like, I, you know, the long term plan is, you know, we want to solve some DEs, we want to do some geometry. Um, and uh, see some nice um, sort of physics systems. So we need to build this bridge, right? We've got to go, there is this really nice abstract high categorical theory. And I really don't mean to like pour any cold water on it. It's, it's, it's took a lot of insights and it's very, um, very nice, but it doesn't connect up with what a working physicist might expect. Um, so this sort of section here is a bit of a reminder. So we, we know that the, the electromagnetism in a modern formulation is all about Faraday tensor, which from a geometric point of view is a, a curvature form, two form. Um, but you might go, what is a, is there such thing as a three form curvature? People talk about um, like higher gauge symmetries and you know, two form symmetries and all these type of things. Um, so the lowest case that's interesting is talking about what geometric object has a three form curvature. Um, and the question Michael Murray asked in the early nineties um, was, you know, thinking about gauge series, can you write the Western mean of Witten term, a topological term in the action as a holonomy of something, right? So you can write the topological terms you know, in other gauge theories coming from like the curvature of a, like the churn number or something, or the instanton number can come from the, the curvature of a connection. Um, but there was this, this interesting term, which came from geometric data, seem, seemingly geometric data, um, but it wasn't the geometric data of anything. Um, and so this led him to invent bundle gerbs, which um, are the sort of geometric objects which carry connections whose curvatures are three forms instead of two forms. Um, so I'm just, I'm just going to sort of splash a bit of definition up here. And the important thing to take away here is that this is like built out of manifolds. Right? It's built out of manifolds and stuff. It's not some kind of category or a stack or a sort of abstract object. You can write these things down extremely explicitly. Um, <clears throat> so some base manifold M, which I'll sort of carry throughout. Uh, if we have some subjective submersion, for instance, you might take an open cover and then like disjoint union all the open sets and then project back down onto M and everything is like, you know, working in local patches and things like that. Um, and instead of an ordinary U1 bundle, you have one that lives up in this extra space consisting of pairs uh, of points in Y satisfying a condition uh, plus some extra data of a section satisfying an extra condition. So the important thing is, is geometric data. You can, you can construct these things extremely explicitly. Um, <clears throat> so then we want to talk about geometry. So the connective structure is again, uh, we don't just have an ordinary connection, 
we have a connection one form on our U1 bundle. And there is a two form, an extra two form that uh, I'm going to draw a picture in a moment uh, where all these things live. Uh, an extra, so it's a one form and a two form. Set of, and then there's some compatibility conditions. So the curvature here is the, the two form curvature of this connection, uh, plus a little bit of extra compatibility, which we don't need to recall now. Um, this two form gets to call the curving. Uh, it's like a curvature, but not quite. Um, so here's a picture. I'm going to draw these. Oh, where's my pen? I'll draw where these things live. Um, so uh, the the sort of mental picture that uh, you can build up is that there's a bunch of spaces have a sort of very regular bunch of relations between them um, so this e here this is like a, this is a u1 bundle uh sitting over y2 um, and this thing has a connection nabla uh, there's a two form down here so the connection uh, and then there's some extra condition which happens on y2 here so curvature of nabla is equal to the, the difference between the pullbacks of B along these two maps. Um, and that difference is uh, denoted. So delta B, which is um, projected on the second factor pullback, and this projection on the first factor pullback. So there's a bunch of geometric thing. And so one thing that uh, follows from this is that the db, the derivative of b, uh, actually is equal to, so this thing is called pi, is equal to the pull up of a unique three form down on m. Uh, and this three form is the curvature, uh, it's closed, it's, it's integral periods, uh, and it's it's um, a Durham gives a Durham cohomology class. So this this sort of stuff is um, sort of goes back to about the mid nineties in, in technology, and this is kind of what what there was until the sort of high gauge theory, high geometry sort of trend really kicked off um, about a decade later. Um, any any comments queries so far? So <clears throat> feel free to pop um, questions in the chat. We'll keep an eye on it as well. Um, so here's, here's a very explicit example. Um, it's, it's in one sense a really like, uh, it's my favorite example. Um, so I'm fi fixing uh, a compact, simple, simply connected Lie group um, down here. Oops. Oops, that's not what I want. Come back to you. Ah, my apologies. That one. So G is compact, simple, simply connected Lie group, for instance, SUN. Um, and I, I think of its Lie algebra equipped with an inner product. Um, here it's given by the inverse of the trace of the product divided by some normalizing factor. Um, <clears throat> There are like other, so for like spin n and, and spn, um, they have their own like little normalizing factors. But essentially, you get this nice uh, invariant, add invariant inner product in the Lie algebra. Um, <clears throat> and we can write down explicit formulas for these um, these things. So PG here is the is the um, space of paths of length two pi starting at the identity. And evaluation here just sends me to the endpoint of the path. Um, this PG times omega, omega G here is the, the subspace of loops that start and end at the identity. Uh, this omega G hat is the universal central extension of the, the loop group. Um, and so these sort of things are sort of, you know, sort of study of those goes back to the 80s and current algebras, the Lie algebras, these things. Um, but we could write down explicit formulas for the, the connection form, uh, Nabla here. Uh, there's, there's a uh, connection form mu. Uh, on omega hat g and some extra like piece of data which we need uh, and 
everything here is sort of formless. Like you can literally like pick pick paths, pick coordinateizations of things and like calculate numbers out of them. Um, and the curving two form, you know, again, it has some explicit formula. So I'm using a lot here the um the inner product. So I take the you know Camaro class on form, you know, and um evaluate it and then evaluate the the inner product and the, the, the algebra output. Um, and so when you look at the three form curvature, it's this rather nice sort of canonical three form that lives on uh, on the, the group G. Um, and this gives the, a generator in uh, Durand cohomology, uh, which um, is the image of like from integral cohomology. Um, and this this uh, three form here is the thing that gives rise to um, the Westman written to them. Um, you could talk about holonomy and things, which I'm not going to do today. So, um, so slightly more general example, um, but less tied to sort of groups. Um, if you start from any principal K bundle, uh, central extension of K uh, of Lie groups, um, you can write down a similar picture, uh, which is called the lifting bundle gerb, because this uh, this structure obstructs the existence of a lift of the, of the structure group from k to k hat right so given given any principal k bundle you could say is this k bundle actually uh secretly a k hat bundle that we've sort of changed the structure group down this down this projection map here um <clears throat> and you know this may or may not exist uh, and this bundle gerb is exactly the obstruction to this um, so one thing i want to point out is that um this sort of staircase structure here we we have um we're going to see this type of thing a lot it just organizes the, the spaces involved so if the bundle q lifts to a, a k hat bundle uh then a bundle gerb inhabits sort of inherits a bit of extra structure you got this um extra u1 bundle here which has some nice properties but what it does is if I um, <clears throat> pull back Q hat along, uh, let's see, I have these these two these two maps here. One is projection on uh, Q, and the other one is act by K on Q. So it's a K bundle. If I pull Q hat along these two um, these maps, then I get uh, an isomorphism to my existing. Um, Sort of existing uh, bundle here, and there's some compatibility. So such such data where I have an extra U1 bundle floating around, uh, and some some isomorphism, or a trivialization of the bundle gerb, and the existence of this trivialization is exactly uh, equivalent to the existence of the lift of the structure group of my original bundle. And so so this this. This will become an analogy for something that's important a bit later. Um, <clears throat> so it seems like a bit of a repackaging uh, of some old, you know, theory going back sort of mid twentieth century. But it's just a nice global picture. So newer picture. Sorry, that's that's all very nineteen nineties. Um, so a new picture is that if we take if this is a bundle. You know, this if this here is a bundle gerb, sort of the. Um, this thing gives E map into Y2, map into Y, map into M. It seems a bit facile to draw it slightly differently, but this E and Y and these maps together um, inherit the structure of, of a Lie groupoid. Um, and you know, there's this sort of global picture where you can think of this as a principal bundle type object. Um, uh, so why um, the the manifold Y is a manifold, so the space Y is a manifold, um, but it might well be infinite dimensional. Um, there's actually um, kind of interesting obstructions that happen. Um, you either have to your 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 manifold Y sort of has to be like rather disconnected, you know, has very disconnected fibers, or um, infinite dimensional fibers to get non non uh, non trivial phenomena. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Um, 
Yeah, so the sort of more modern viewpoint is that we can think of like this is the total space of some principal bundle like object, uh, except it's not just a manifold, it's got like extra rich structure. Um, and the structure two group is uh, something like a shifted U1, if you like. Right. It's kind of like when you do, um, you know, when you're doing, um, oh, people do like BRST type stuff and you've got ghosts coming in. Um, that's like the, at the Lie algebra level, you have like these shifts of, of, of gradings, but this is like at the Lie group level and we've shifted you one. Um, <clears throat> but it's uh, an example of something called, um, it arises from something called a cross module. So these cross modules um, play the role of the structure group. Um, the sort of the two group cross module is a, is a um, sort of two sides of the same coin. So it's a bit easier to describe cross modules. Um, so cross module, we have a, a pair of groups linked by a homomorphism. And from that homomorphism, we have to uh, we get a whole bunch of other little sort of subsidiary groups. Um, <clears throat> and this homomorphism basically is stitching together uh, a central extension of a normal subgroup. So we have a, a central extension of the normal subgroup, um, plus some interesting like extra sort of self-action. Um, <clears throat> so uh, like, K being normal in K being normal in L is L will act by the adjoint action on K. Uh, so then like K hat is going to be a principal A bundle over a space with an L action, and we ask that we get a lift of that action sort of as group homomorphisms. And there's you know, as always extra uh, compatibilities. And you know, two groups and cross modules are up in anyway. Theorems to say you can pass backwards and forwards between them. Um, cross modules are like less uh, redundant information to describe these things. Um, but the upshot is that um, from any cross module, so this, if you like, this, oh, hang on, there's a arrow missing. Ah, there we go. Um, from any a cross module like this thing in the middle here it decomposes as a central extension of an odd like you have some ordinary group and then you want to sort of you know make it bigger extend it uh, by something which we've already seen this kind of abelian you know, a here was u1 um, which we'll sort of take as a generic example um, <clears throat> and this is you know sort of looks like a short exact sequence of you know, these higher sort of objects. Um, and so you can ask things like, well, let's say I had an ordinary uh, principal G bundle and I wanted to lift it to some kind of interesting bundle where the structure group, you know, was played by a cross module instead. So um, we need an example of a non-trivial cross module. So uh, this is the, um, so as it turns out, my, my favorite example of the bundle joke from before also carries an extra structure. It carries a structure of a, of a cross module. Um, so the map sending uh, the central extension of the loop group down to the loop group and then included into PG. Uh, so, yeah. oops, that's this one. I'm going to go G hat onto uh, omega g as a central extension which is then normal inside the space of paths uh, and the adjoint action of part the conjugation action of part pointwise pointwise conjugation action of paths on loops um, was lifted by our base friends Schreiber and Stevenson um, up to omega g hat and again it's not like oh we proved there exists a lift they write down a formula um, for this stuff. Um, and as it happens, there's actually a mistake in that 
sign mistake in that definition, um, which I found. And uh, John Bayes is very graciously um, proofreading my corrections. Um, like, you know, I can see it was a mistake because I plugged in some vectors, calculated some numbers, and, and got a contradiction. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, and and from from any cross module, you can take the Lie algebras, um, and then the action also um, passes down to like action by derivations on the algebras, and these are the two term L infinity algebras, which sort of higher connection to value in. Um, so. So that's, yeah, I think that's the end of my prepared material. Now, now we turn transform it into a virtual board talk. Um, <clears throat> so any any comments, questions so far? So, so the two groups uh, that you introduced, which uh, is equivalent to cross modules, uh, yep. is there any topology on them? So if we consider to the groups kind of thing, what do they yes. correspond to? Um, yeah, so the everything is smooth here. So this is be a smooth homomorphism. The action will be smooth. Um, so it's possible to do this just with discrete groups as well. Um, and there's a there's a same sort of correspondence. Um, but uh, yeah, you have to maybe be a little bit careful about the topology. So here I wrote the action uh sort of pg like a path and an element in this extension mapping to there sometimes you might see it like pg mappings to automorphisms of this group uh except these are infinite dimensional lie groups uh and so like automorphisms automorphism groups of infinite dimensional lie groups are kind of terrifying to me um so we we kind of just make sure we write them we say well the map is smooth if you know it's smooth in each coordinate sort of thing uh, rather than mapping to an automorphism group so trying to do some sort of harmonic analysis kind of thing is kind of difficult then on two groups huh? um yeah so there are there is a i did have a finite dimensional example um which is uh nora ganter's topological tori um and they're actually finite dimensional, like you can they build out of layout, like um abelian Lie algebras and, and oh. um things like this. So you could actually do um much uh, you know that would be more like you know, like Fourier type thing. Yeah, it's perfectly fine to write down um, and uh I should also say um so this is in the smooth category, like these are smooth loops and smooth paths. Um people have studied about like changing the regularity, like um, Sobolev index, you know, maybe or even like L2 um, paths, you know, if you take a matrix representation and sort of complete up these things so they can become Hilbert Lie groups, um, they could be easier. But these are these, um, these ones, just in the way I use them, I use them as fresh A uh, in a fresh A space setting. Um, I see. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Like, what is the correct notion of harmonic analysis on a two group? Like, some kind of invariant thing. Um, you know, like, there's so much to explore. Like, we're only really at the, the start of, of fully exploring um, the connection to more traditional classical mathematical um, fields. Um, okay, so. Um, Okay, so uh, yes, so this this picture, this this is sort of the picture when you sort of think about. Um, so I don't, you know, how do, how do you build uh, a, whatever a principal bundle is supposed to be for like this sort of algebraic object in the middle? Um, I know how to build an, uh, an ordinary principal bundle. You know, you go down to the dime store and you grab you know, half a dozen, right? Um, I know how to think about bundle gerbs. You know, these are things that people have been thinking about for um, almost 30 years now. So there's a big, big literature. Uh, and people study them widely. So you can go ask your local bundle gerb expert. Uh, but somehow we need to build, patch these things together and that, what, what is happening in the middle. Um, okay, so 
Um, da, 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 da. All right. So, so how? What is this? This thing here. So, if we had, um, all right, how do we want to do this? Okay. So, if we had um, essentially extension, just ordinary Lie groups this time, and uh, a principal. I had K before, didn't I? Let me just switch these to Ks. Um, and a principal K bundle. Uh, this is rehashing a little bit, but just to sort of just give a slightly different perspective. Um, <clears throat> and let's say we had a principal U1 bundle sitting on my principal K bundle. Right, then somehow the fibers look, you know, well, these, the fibers of this bottom projection look like K, you know, up to like translation or something. Uh, the fibers upstairs look like U1, and hopefully the fibers of like going all the way down, you know, do they look like uh, K hat? Right? And so um, what you do is you think about having K hat act on Q, you could project K hat down to K, then act on Q as a, as a space with the K action. Um, and you want to lift the K hat action to P. Uh, and then that gives you a principal K hat bundle uh, sitting over all the way downstairs. Um, and we want to sort of emulate this idea of saying, well, what if I have, right, instead of an ordinary extension of um, uh, Lie groups here. What if this was my kind of two group extension where I had in the middle was some cross module or some two group? Then, like the bottom half looks like a principal G bundle. That's kind of, I don't know how that works. The upstairs bit, instead of being a U1 bundle, should be a gerb, a uh, bundle gerb. Uh, and then some kind of bizarro, some action or some kind of compatibility data putting them together. So then the whole two stage thing from the top down to the bottom should be. Uh, two bundle. Um, so the the correct sort of structure here is is kind of it's uh, complex, but uh, like explicit and understandable. It is not it is not at the level of um, well, I have some model category on like simplicial pre sheaves on the site of manifolds, and it's all you know like. You know, go read half of Jacob Fleury's Biotopos Theory thousand page book to like understand the definitions. It's not that. It's more just there's a, a, a bunch of moving parts, but it's built out of very classical objects. Um, <clears throat> so instead, so to recall the lifting bundle gerb, which we had earlier. Um, uh, this hat. So we could build this object just from the data of the central extension um, and the, the original principal bundle. And there's there's some extra sort of bits and pieces and data. Um, <clears throat> this here is, this looks like a U1 bundle, except I'm replacing this in my sort of cartoon analogy up here. This is going to be a bundle job instead. So this thing should be replaced by a bundle job. Uh, and this thing is called a bundle two job. So the naming is not terribly imaginative. Um, I once had a senior category theorist complain to me that people just stuck like a prefix on everything and just say it's a new theorem. Um, but there's a lot of work sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so there's there's a bunch of ways to present these things, and they're all very complex. But the like this the intuitive idea that you know I have some subjective submersion. Uh, and then I have some sort of correspondence space and on that sits a gerb and then a bunch of stuff happens. So that that's kind of the, the key intuitive picture. And this goes back to like Carey, Murray and Wang in the sort of mid to late nineties. Um, they had this idea and that, um, and then sort of like had sort of one construction, uh, but then it was just to then develop the theory uh, was uh, Danny Stevenson's uh, PhD thesis. So names here, Kerry, Murray, um, Brian Wang, um, sort of, it's about like 97, 98 or thereabouts. 
um, and Danny Stevenson, his PhD thesis. Um, it's about 2000. Um, you know, and theory to sort of develop in its full generality is quite you know, complicated. Um, but, you know, these are higher categorical objects. And so it's like, well, okay, there's an isomorphism, but then there's like additional compatibility data and higher arrows. Um, and so, you know, unless you sort of have some control about what's going on and try to make things as rigid and like, um, Sort of controlled as possible, things get out of hand. Um, this sort of combinatorial explosion in factors of you know coordinates of things you have to to take care of and simplicial techniques and so on. Um, so there's a, there's a full definition is in the the archive paper, but I'm just going to sketch um, an outline of the picture. So the bundle jerk picture was you know some nice little staircase diagram. It was manifolds that related in certain ways. Um, Built out of traditional objects, just in a new way. So um, I might just put this skin on. So to, to build a bundle two jerk, you sort of have to start telling yourself this story. So I'll have a subjective submersion, and then I build this sort of correspondence space. In fact, I sort of you know, like it so much, I'm going to build a few more heading out this way. Um, I think just four is fine. Um, so these are like pairs, triples, and quadruples of points in Y that all like sit in the same fiber over M. Um, but then I need to build a bundle job here. So then I have another subjective submersion, uh, and I have to build up some extra sort of spaces. And this is all just scaffolding. Um, and this is meant to be a bundle job, so that has a, a U1 bundle sitting on it. Um, <clears throat> and then I need to do some extra stuff right on on the definition of bundle gerb you know i sort of had some extra sections and conditions that sit lived, lived over y3 uh here um you know i'm dealing with bundle gerbs not u1 bundles and so the the structures you have to be extremely careful to set them up so that they don't get out of hand um so i have something like uh I'm just going to draw some hieroglyphics. Uh, I build some new U1 bundle over there out of E, uh, and that has a section which I call capital M. And there's some extra little compatibility stuff that happens over here. That's not so important. Um, and this is the last one, I promise. Um, then there's some extra condition over here, which is like, looks like some kind of associativity condition. Um, but the thing to emphasizes that this uh, picture that, oh, I need some bundle gerb sitting here. So I can color this in. There's some bundle gerb sitting here over Y2 plus some technical data, nasty technical stuff. That's sort of nice, and this is technical and a bit nasty, but explicit. Um, And um, here we go. And we can build explicit examples of these things. So um, <clears throat> if I start with, for instance, the, the, the bundle gerb sitting on my compact, simple, simple, uh, simply connected Lie group, um, which has this cross module structure um, coming from Bayes-Crenz, Schreiber, and Stevenson, um, I can start with the principal G bundle and build such a bundle gerb. Um, and it's all sort of nicely explicit. Um, but then uh, what I want to do is to say in the lifting bundle job story, when I lifted ordinary bundles, I had some kind of thing that, that, that apparently trivialized a bundle job. And then that was the same thing as giving a lift, which is the same thing as like figuring out how to put this U1 bundle over this K bundle into a K hat bundle. Um, so here, I have to build in some extra bundle gerb. Um, and this has some 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 relation to this. This one F has some relation to the thing E. Um, I'm going to write down a, an explicit example later. Um, but the uh, but the result of um, let's see, Murray 
uh, me, uh, Danny Stevenson, Raymond Bozo, uh, in ATMP, um, it's part of a, a bigger paper, is that if I have this sort of this extra bundle jib hanging on the right hand side, uh, which acts as a trivialize, whatever trivialization means here, there's a, there's a definition we can write down. Um, and we started with this sort of um, this specific construction starting from a, a principal bundle uh, and uh, the BCSS cross module. Uh, the trivialization, oops. So I'll give you the slogan. Um, the details are. Um, so this this sort of specific example we can write down. It's called the Chun Science Two Jib, um, coming from the thesis work of uh, Stuart Johnson. Um, the trivialization of the Chun Science Two Jib is a. Um, String G equivariant um, bundle chip. This is like this this uh, this analogy of saying um, I need you know, uh, what is it Q going to M and I have K hat acting on Q. You know this. Making this Q hat, which is a priori just a U1 bundle, K hat equivariant is how I build sort of the overall K hat bundle. Um, and string G, which is this Bayes Kranz Stryber Stevenson cross module, I can say what it means to be equivariant for that. Um, and getting the right sort of ingredients where I can start patching together or an ordinary bundle plus a gerb to be some kind of um, higher, higher bundle. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> so how I want to write down an example of one of these things. Sort of this is this is our, our nice little case study. So uh, any questions? A little, little bits and pieces here. Okay. Um. So. Here's my example. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to let um, H inside G both be, let's see, the compact simple simply connected. Totally groups. Right, and they have to satisfy a condition such that. Um, so if I take the this inner product coming from the killing form of uh, the Lie algebra of G, if I restrict that to H, that should be the same as the the this killing form on H. Um, so in general, there's an extra like integer which scales these things called the Dinkin index. Um, so this is this condition is known as the Dinkin index one condition. Um, so, for instance, you know, S U N inside S uh, U N plus K, for instance, um, or like you know, spin N inside spin N plus K, as long as N is um, at least five or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so, if we have this, Um, so if you have this, we can write down a nice big sort of grid of information. So our base is going to be the homogeneous space G mod H. So for instance, the pi sphere, um, SU3 mod SU2 or something like that. Um, 
there's some nice homogeneous spaces you could write down here. Uh, and then I go, well, that's a principal H bundle. And so then I can start building out my little space. Uh, then sitting over here, I have this nice bundle gerb, which comes from the uh, uh, pH times lambda H. And I'm sitting over here, P times pH and omega H at. Okay, that's that's perfectly nice. This thing here is a bundle gerb. Um, gives me a, a Chern Simons two gerb, which is a whole bunch of black box technical details. I'm not going to draw there. Um, but then G also carries a nice carries a nice bundle gerb, which we saw early on. So PG PG times omega G, and then <coughs> The same thing, let's say omega g hat. Um, and then this uh, this bundle job here is the, the trivialization data that we 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 sort of are interested in. Um, <clears throat> and so what this is looking like is you know we know that um, you know, where we have some kind of homogeneous space, the choice of particular sort of isometry group or whatever, um, you can pick different ones. Um, <clears throat> you know, so we could write, for instance, like sphere. You know, we can write a sphere as you know, SO n uh, plus one mod SO n. So that's the same thing as uh, spin n plus one mod spin in and you know i've passed to a larger group but i'm getting the same homogeneous space um, but i'm getting different geometry so what this is doing is essentially um representing uh g on h as string g mod string and I'll maybe put some quotes on this be a little bit careful but uh, string H and where string G is the sort of underlying structure that lives up here. Uh, and string H is this other sort of red pinkish stuff here. Um, <clears throat> and so ultimately what we get is uh, we have this, uh, like this, so something like uh, P G times omega, G hat um, packages itself up into a, a Lie groupoid, which maps down to um, G mod H. So, at the sort of once I define bundle jets, uh earlier than I said, well, there's more modern pictures. You get some nice Lie groupoid, and it sits over the base, and it's something like a principal U1 bundle, um, but not like it's a shifted U1, right? Uh, shifted u1 bundle um but here this is a this this thing looks like a uh omega h at ph um bundle uh and this this is sort of there's a lot of sort of little moving bits um and sort of tentacles that reach out to sort of different uh, bits of motivation um, but that's sort of, we, you know, we get this, you know, genuine, non-trivial, uh, sort of non-abelian, sort of higher uh, two bundles. Um, so, I mean, this is sort of at the level of spatial stuff, you know, and then the whole sort of thing is to say, all right, now we've managed to define our bundle, we need to actually get the geometry on it. Um, so I should point out work of um, uh, wrist, recent work of wrist, uh, so CF, uh, same and, and Wolf, um, last year, it's 22, um, 21, 22, I can't quite remember, um, just got one good paper together. Um, they sort of taken this, this idea and actually um, said, all right, Let's take the four sphere, right? We write it as a nice homogeneous space, 
and can actually you know hook up formulas for differential forms. Um, I think yeah, I gave a talk in um, Perry at what university was Saint Christian Simon's uh, Home Institute twenty or fourteen or something, um, uh, and he sort of slept on that idea for a bit, and then that came this sort of nice paper. Um, and they actually wrote down a bunch of connections and sort of used this philosophy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so everything everything I've said, like we had the example of bundle gerbs and we could put connective data on it and we could be very explicit. You know, we could write down explicit formulas. Um, we can do the same thing with these bundle two gerbs. So if I sort of scroll myself up a little bit, uh, there's a giant, giant black box happening here, which I don't really want to go into. Um, but we can, you know, these these uh, these gerbs here that are PG, omega G, omega G hat, they carry differential form data uh, we saw earlier. Um, you know, this is this green one and there's this pink one that carries some differential form data. Um, and there's a few more sort of bits and pieces they have to supply because the structure is a bit richer. Um, but we can write down formulas um, with Aaron Bozo. Um, write down formulas for all of these connections. Um, connections data, the two form data, there's extra three form data. Uh, there's a whole bunch of compatibilities um, and ultimately you get down to um, uh, yeah you get uh, there's like a, a four form sitting down on g mod h um, which is looks you know roughly like trace of f squared if we're given a connection on this principal h bundle um, and we can we can find a, a anti-derivative for that and it's sort of very very hugely geometric you know it's like at the level of I've got Kobayashi and Nomatsu and looking at like what does it mean to talk about ten, you know, invariant tensors on homogeneous spaces. Um so it uh let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, and, and this this connective data that we get is sort of the stuff that's appearing um sort of in the literature a little bit. Um but it doesn't have this interpretation of trying to build like non-abelian uh higher like higher connections um and i think probably maybe another connection i should point out um is that sort of we get um let's see the geometric string structures um so these, so the string structure is something that was invented in the eighties um, by killing back and people like that. Thinking about what does it mean, like what is the obstruction to like well definedness of um, sort of uh, string partition functions and so on. Um, and they had conditions in terms of like the the structure group of the loop space should lift to like the the spin cover or something, whatever that means in an infinite dimensional setting. Um, but then people like um, Belinsky and McLaughlin in the 90s um, and uh, um, Stoltz and Teichner sort of in the early 2000s sort of getting towards more um, geometrically rich picture um, and I think maybe sort of not it's not necessarily the completely final word um, so these geometric string structures defined by Conrad Waldorf um, about 2013 or so, um, they look like, you know, they should be string connections. There should be connections for these like higher geometric bundles. Um, and we get, you know, explicit formulas to give the things that um, we defined uh, in his article. Um, anything else, anything else? Yeah. And so, this is part of an evolving story. Um, so the the, the paper, uh, the preprint is, is a part one. Um, so there'll be sequels coming out uh, hopefully this year, um, putting together a lot of these ideas to uh, eventually write down some really concrete uh, objects. We've got to build up this theory. It's really like, you know, the, the, the paper is long and gets um, technical because we're connecting back to this very technical theory um you know we're, we're trying to prove some definition holds uh and it's a you know very um rich and complex definition 
back down to like very concrete mathematical objects, but just repackaged in a, in a, in a different way. And then sort of once we've got, you know, we're, we're building this bridge, but then once we've got our bridge, you know, connecting the sort of much more simple practitioner side of things back to the theory, we can say, well, that bridge is there. And now we just want to focus on the, um, you know, solving some kind of high and Bill's equations or something like that um, in, in a concrete way. So I might uh, stop there um, and happy to sort of uh, let's take, thank David for this very inspirational talk. So we have uh, seen that uh, there is a close connection between a uh, uh, very uh, abstract mathematics and uh, some uh, parts of physics. I mean, uh, some higher categorical things appear in theoretical physics and Theoretical physics also give uh, inspirational examples to mathematics as well, I mean. So mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, it is uh, very uh, 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 nice to hear your talk, I mean. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so any questions or comments, by the way? So maybe I will just ask one thing about the uh, two groups correspond to uh, that those uh, cross modules, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. for example, is there notion called, for example, there are those papers of bias, uh, like higher algebra, uh, like he discusses yeah. two Lie algebras, for example. So is there some yeah. correspondence? Uh, so what two Lie algebras correspond to in terms of cross modules kind of thing? Do uh, we yes, have good. such things? Yes. Um, so these here, so I didn't uh, name it as such. So um, uh, high dimensional algebra five. So high dimensional algebra five and six. One is on groups and one is on algebras. Right. Um, uh, so I'll just start a fresh thing down here. Um, beep, beep. So one is with Aaron Lauder and one is with Alyssa Kranz. So Bayes, uh, Kranz, and Bayes, Lauder. So this one is uh, two out, Li two algebras. One is uh, two groups. Um, yeah, so it's HDA five and six. Um, yeah, so the Lie two algebras, you get a, a, a concept of something called um, a cross module of Lie algebras. So, <clears throat> so this one, um, you have something like uh, I'm just going to switch letters because I, I don't know how to write a calligraphic L properly, a fractor L properly. Um, so maybe like G hat going to H. Um, map of Lie algebras such that uh, if this is like tau, then um, Kerr tau going to G hat going to M tau is a central extension of Lie algebras. Uh, you have M T M tau is an ideal inside H, uh, and there's uh, action by derivations on on uh, G hat. Like this, um, and there's some some conditions, um, <clears throat> and this like this has to lift the uh, action by derivations on the image of tau. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, and so if you have a, a Lie two group, so it's like a cross module. So if you have a cross module of Lie groups, you just take Lie algebras everywhere and the derivative of some maps, and that gives you exactly one of these. Oh, um, to go the to go the other way, yeah. So if you had like G hat H, you could you could go take the Lie algebras, um, and so these uh, turn out to be so the theorem is that um, these cross modules of Lie algebras turn out to be uh, two term L infinity algebras. Um, 
<clears throat> uh, possibly with um, there's like a, a triple bracket in the L infinity algebra it vanishes. Um, so it's like in the in the sort of group world that means that like the group structure is strictly associative rather than associative after isomorphism. So this like triple bracket in the L infinity algebra vanishing is is an algebra version of that. Um, yeah, and so I mean, going from Lie algebras to Lie groups, I mean that's there's an uh, that's uh, a little bit more subtle. Like you know, like these theorems about how to like does every the algebra integrate up to a Lie group? Well, classically, right. yes, but Lie two algebras is a bit more subtle. Um, I think work of like Chen Cheng Zhu, um, Chen Cheng to um and collaborators think about like how to go back from the algebras or possibly even algebroids uh yeah i can't quite remember i mean it might be it's not something i've particularly looked at i mean this is like because there should be some kind of integration theory that has to be yeah there, right yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh I know, yeah, Chen Zheng Zhu, uh Andre Enriquez, that's that's the person I think is really uh yeah. Enriquez. Um uh possibly Urs Schreiber and collaborators. Because yeah, Urs Schreiber worked with um like uh Jim Stashev a bit because Jim Stashev is very much an L infinity type of guy. Um uh and like Hisham Sati sort of about 14 or so years ago with some papers. Um yeah, integrating L infinity morphisms. I think that's another I don't know who wrote that paper. There's a bunch of people, right? It's all about between the years about 2009 to 2013 or something. There's a few papers about this. Um, yeah, it's great. I can't remember who wrote this. It might have been Enriquez. That's a that's a paper, and they do more general, just the two term case. They do like mm -hmm. given a maybe just a truncated L infinity algebra. Uh, when can we integrate it up to something like a um, a Khan complex in manifolds or something like that? So some kind of comp model for higher group words. Um, but the sort of the, the two term case is much more concrete and you can get away with not using simplicial methods and so forth. Um, yeah. Thank you. So, any more questions or comments? Uh, can I ask a question too? Sure, of yeah, course. Sure. MJ? Uh, can we carry this structure that you have the construct to higher dimensions? Uh, we can easily carry any cross modules uh, to the next categorical dimensions. Can we define these structures for two cross modules? Do you have uh, any ideas? Uh, uh, in principle, um, I think it's... probably possible and pushing the limit. So like what we're doing here has already brought um, the complexity to where I think is almost like the least it can go. And so that allows us maybe to have a little bit of extra room to go up. Um, but one thing I should point out is that our paper sort of was done independently uh, and in parallel to uh, um, Chris Kotke and Richard Melrose um, wrote a paper called Bygerbs. Um, and their their sort of model is quite similar to ours. Um, like Richard Melrose came to my university and gave a talk. And I was sitting there sort of sweating because it's like, oh dear, this is like kind of similar to what we're doing. Um, and he's a big shot. Um it turned out to be sufficiently different that it's it's uh, it's not too bad. But um <clears throat> So Kotka and Melrose, they do this sort of two gerb thing. So there's like a um, but then they say, what if we have 
like not just you know this planar display you know it, it's kind of two-dimensional display of array of spaces but if you have some kind of cubicle display right you're starting to build out like three dimensions worth of, of data um so they are kind of uh inching towards what you describe but they don't actually do it um and yes using two cross modules so um this where is it here this this kind of idea that you could take a cross module and a sub cross module and somehow um, build like a homogeneous higher bundle out of it um that that should work if you have a pair of two cross modules so if i go let's see p let's say let's say it's p l m let's say that's a two cross module um say of lee groups uh, and then you have let's say m0 l0 p0 another cross module uh, that sits in another two cross module that sits inside that one and then you could ask uh, what like <clears throat> this you know some kind of appropriate um structure which encoded the fact that i can do you know if this thing is called curly g and this thing is called curly g naught and this sits inside here and then some kind of interesting categorical quotient here then um you know this this should in some sense just like a central extension of groups is also a, a principal bundle a central extension of lie groups um but even if you don't have a normal subgroup, you still get a principal bundle. So if you just have some any old closed subgroup, you, know, you can talk about like Lie groups, you get some principal H bundle. If you have some kind of two cross module structure here and a sub two cross module structure here, you could say, well, what does it mean to be a uh, some kind of higher bundle? But um, that's that's an exercise to work out all the details that's for sure thank you this is yeah, thinking off the top of my head <clears throat> oh if there is no more questions or com comments uh we will stop our recording now <clears throat>